All right. Oops. It just just switched again. All right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, everyone. Hope you are all doing well. Um, alhamdulillah, I see some uh, familiar names in the uh, in the list. Some uh, Al Noor students and teachers, and then some people I don't necessarily know. So I can uh, briefly introduce uh, myself. My name is uh, Hamza Hensha, and uh, I currently am the uh, assistant head of school at Al Noor Academy um, in in Mansfield, the Mansfield campus. Um, and uh, so this program is actually, it stems from a, uh, a series of khutbahs um, I, uh, I did uh, over, the, actually the first time I did it was back in 2015. And then this year we're doing some outdoor jumas um, in, in Mansfield. And I've been again, sort of going, going through this. Um, so the topic is seven habits of highly effective Muslim teenagers. Uh, so all of this is based um, sort of on the work of someone named Stephen Covey, who wrote a very famous book that, that people may have heard of, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, and then his son, actually, Sean Covey, uh, wrote a, another book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Te Teenagers uh, or Teens. Um, and uh, the amazing thing as I went, as I uh, read both of these books is I found that almost all of these, uh, these habits that are discussed in, in uh, both of those books are things which we find inside of our beautiful uh, Dean of Islam. So for today, I'm just going to be uh, going through this. Um, so I wanted to start with a poem. Uh, could I get a volunteer to read this poem? Um, how about uh, anyone want to volunteer or should I call on someone? How about, uh, I see Lean Atiyah, one of my students. Could you read this poem, please? Are you here, Lean? There. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Uh, who am I? I am your kid. I am your constant companion. I am your greatest helper or heaviest burden. I will push you onward or drag you down to failure. I am completely at your command. Half the things you do, you might, you might have to do. I will be able to do them quickly and correctly. I am easily managed. You must merely be firm with me. Show me exactly how you want to do it. For a few lessons, I will do it automatically. I am, I am the servant of all great individuals and I, alas, of all failures, as uh, of all fa failures, as well. those who are great, I have made great. Those who are failures, I have made failures. I am not a machine, though I work with all the precision of a, of a machine plus the intelligence of a human. You may run me for a profit or run me for ruin. It makes no difference to me. Take me, take me, train me, be firm with me, and I will place the world at your feet. Be easy. Okay, thank you. I know it, it sounded like your mic was cutting in and out a little bit. Anyone have any guesses as to who this poem is about? Anyone think they can figure out who am I? I'm trying to make this as interactive as possible. So anyone have any guesses? Who could this person be? Who could, the, what could this poem be about? Time. Time, good guess, good guess. Uh, it, it's connected to that in some ways, I guess. Think about the, the um, title of this uh, talk today or the subject matter. All right, what's the, what did I say the title of this talk was going to be today? Seven what? Oh, I see things in the chat. Ah, uh, Aya, you want to say that out loud? Um, habits. Habits, yes. Who am I? Uh, I am, let's see, is it going to come up? I am habit. Okay, so I'm habit. Habit is our constant companion, our greatest helper, or our heaviest burden. I will push you onward or drag you down to failure. I am completely at your command. Half the things you do might 
uh, might just as well turn over to me and I will be able to do them quickly and correctly. Think about how important our habits are. Our habits are really control our lives. I am easily managed. You must merely be firm with me. Show me exactly how you want something done. And after a few lessons, I will do it automatically. I am the servant of all great individuals and alas of all failures as well. Those who are great, I have made great. Those who are failures, I have made failures. We can see the importance of our habits here. I am not a machine, though I work with the precision of a machine plus the intelligence of a human. You may run me for a profit or run me for ruin. It makes no, no difference to me. Take me, train me, be firm with me, and I will place the world at your feet. Be easy with me, and I will destroy you. Okay, so habits are incredibly uh, powerful things. These are uh, one of the few things in this world that we really have control over. And if we uh, learn to develop uh, good habits, then it is going to be the, the key to our success. So that's sort of the framework for all of that we're talking about. So teenage angst, does any of this sound familiar? Uh, Adnan, are you here? Adnan al -Tubgi? I thought I saw him earlier, maybe I didn't. Uh, yes. Okay, a, a, a different Adnan. Uh, Adnan, different could, Adnan. Uh, could you could you read if it's not too echoey? Oh yes. Could could you read some of the uh, like the the first column here? There's too much time. There's too much time to do and not enough time. I've got school, homework, job, friends, parties, and family on top of everything else. I'm totally stressed out. Help. Excellent. Uh, next one. Uh, how about Amna Nazir? Um, my family is a disaster. That one? Yep. Okay. Um, my family is a disaster. If I could only get my parents off my back, I might be able to live. It seems they're constantly napping, and I can't ever seem to satisfy them. Excellent. Uh, how about we have, uh, is this Aya Brahimi? Can you do the next one? I'm not doing so well. I teach online for a living now, so I like to call on people. I don't know, maybe she's not available. How about Danya? Danya, presumably Abdul Al. Okay. Can you read that? I'm not doing too well in school right now. Uh, sorry, what? The voice cut out. Can you read the third one down? I'm not doing too well. I'm not doing too well in school right now. If I don't get my grades, I'll never get into college. Okay, and can you do the next one as well? I feel as if my life is out of control. Okay, and finally, how about, uh, is it Lena Alawi? Yeah, um, it's too hard to make my prayers on time. What will people think if they see my foot, see me put my foot in the sink? And uh, maybe you can just do the last one as well, Lena. I started another diet. I think it's my fifth one this year. I really do want to change, but I just don't have the discipline to stick with it. Each time I start a new diet, I have hope, but it's usually only a short time before I blow it. And then I feel awful. Okay, so these are all things that, that some of us may have felt at different times. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, different people have different struggles and different challenges. But as a, as a teenager, uh, I certainly know when I was a teenager, I uh, went through a, a lot of these uh, different ones. Um, and actually, most of these come straight from uh, Sean Covey's uh, book. But I added that uh, one that it's... Too, it's too hard to make my prayers on time. What will people think if they see me put my foot in the sink? This one is sort of, uh, I added this uh, from uh, personal experience. Um, so I actually uh, became Muslim myself uh, when I was in high school. So when I was uh, about uh, 15 years old, so probably a similar age to many of you, um, I became Muslim at a school called St. Mark's. Um, so St. Mark's is a uh, private school uh, in Southboro, Massachusetts. And one of my classmates there, his name was Nabil. 
And, uh, you know, he, he came to the school um, and, you know, it was a boarding school, so he was very far from his family. Um, and he, mashallah, was a practicing Muslim living in a boarding school, living in a, in a dorm with, with a, a, you know, a bunch of people that he didn't necessarily uh, know. And I'm so glad that he didn't think this way, that it's too hard to make my prayers on time. What will people think if they see me put my foot in the sink? I remember at night, when uh, you know it was time for us to get ready for bed, we would be all we would all be in the bathroom. We shared a we shared a bathroom, and people would be brushing their teeth and so on. And he would be doing all this weird stuff with the water. He'd be like you know taking the water in his hands, putting it on his face, put, sucking it in his nose and and stuff. Uh, and then the most shocking thing was he would actually take his feet and put them in the sink. Now I know if you're in public or something, you know, there are other ways to wash your feet other than putting in your sink. But Nabil was very unapologetic with how he did things. And then he would go back to his room and he would uh, lay out his uh, prayer carpet and he would actually call the adhan out loud. And anyway, he was completely unapologetic in the way he practiced his, his, uh, his deen. And as a result, instead of being affected by the, the environment that he was in, he affected the environment. And actually three of us uh, I mean, it's a long story, but uh, over t eventually three of us ended up embracing Islam uh, at his hands. Um, so, uh, you know, these are these are all things that we might struggle with and that we can try to seek to address by uh, by working on our habits. So but first we need to look at the seven habits of highly defective teens. Okay, sometimes it's best to understand something by what it's not. Um, so these habits, uh, you'll see more uh, at the end. Um, uh, uh, why why they're written this way, but the seven habits of highly defective teens, habit one, to, to just react, just to always react to, to things. Habit number two, begin with no end in mind, with no goal in your mind. Habit number three, put first things last. Put our, uh, the things which should be first, we put them last. Habit number four, to think win-lose. Habit five, seek first to talk and then pretend to listen. I think this sounds familiar to some of us. Think first to talk, then pretend to listen. Habit number six, don't cooperate. And habit number seven, wear yourself out. So I think we can all agree that if these are the habits that we've developed, then we would, we would really be struggling. Okay, so habits really, habits equal destiny. Habits uh, are these things just like that poem when we started. When we first we we first make our habits and then our habits make us. Okay, there's another famous saying. First, you sow a thought. Sow means to like plant, you know, plant a seed. Um, you sow a thought and you reap an act. Reap means to harvest. So you plant the uh, you plant a thought, and you harvest an act. Sow a thought and you reap an act. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. So these habits, right, these habits which start with our thoughts, right, which then lead to our actions, these are things which are going to ultimately affect our destiny, right? And so obviously, as Muslims, there are certain habits that we should have, waking up early, uh, taking action, showing gratitude. These are all things that we've heard uh, many times before, but I want to frame this in a slightly different way, using this this. Um, uh, system that, 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 that Stephen and Sean Covey came up with, the seven habits. So here is what it looks like. Um, so habits are, this, this is a Venn diagram, which I'm sure you guys have all seen in, in uh, school before. So effective habits uh, involve the interplay of our knowledge, our skills, and our desire. When those three things overlap, our knowledge, our, uh, our uh, know-how, our skills um, and our desire, when those things all overlap, then we develop habits. And he structured the, uh, the seven habits um, in, in terms of this, uh, this tree that we see here. Um, so he's, uh, for today, what we're going to actually be talking about are the roots of the tree. Okay, the roots of the tree, those are the, these private victories, habit number one, two, and three. Right, because those are, those are the foundational ones. Those are the ones privately that we do inside of ourselves. Uh, and then, inshallah, I believe uh, Brother Ahmed has a second session uh, scheduled uh, in a couple weeks in Ramadan, where we'll talk about the other habits, habits four through four through seven. Right. So, what are uh, the roots of this tree? 
Uh, I'll say them quickly now, but I'll go into much more detail in a, in a few minutes. Uh, the first is to be proactive, our first habit. Second, begin with the end in mind. And habit number three, to put first things first. Okay, so those are the three that we're going to talk today. And uh, inshallah, these are the, the roots of this, this habit tree. But first we need to talk about paradigms. Okay, so paradigms um, are, uh, you know, things, things which, um, uh, viewpoints uh, or ways that we see the world, right? And there are lots of different ways that we can see the world. Um, let's look at these images. Uh, so we see this first image, right? Can anyone share either in the chat or by speaking out loud what they see in that, uh, in that picture? What do you guys see in the picture there? This first one and that honeycomb. Anyone see anything there? Okay, the head of a duck. I hear the head of a duck. Uh, duck and a rabbit, bunny or duck. Okay, now that you've now that you've said that, maybe when you first looked at it, a, a bunny duck. I like it. <laughs> um, when you first look at it, it looks sort of like this is the you know uh, I guess in both cases this is the eye, but it's a duck sort of with its bill looking up uh, in in one direction. Um, and if you look at it the other way, it looks like a, a a rabbit right when those the the bill become becomes its ears what about this other picture what do you see here okay i see a person playing a saxophone and i see a lady do people see both of those things Can you see the person playing the saxophone if you look just at the black right then we see the person playing the saxophone if you look sort of uh, in, a, in a different way, it looks like uh, the silhouette of a woman, right? So uh, you, can, you can see sort of a guy, maybe an older guy with a with fairly large nose playing a saxophone, uh, or you can see the picture of a woman. So all of this has to do with the paradigm, the way that we, that we uh, uh, see things. Now, in this case, Many of you may have seen these images before. These are called ambiguous images, um, which can be seen in different ways. Because, because of the way this was set up, what do you see? The implication was there's more than one thing to see. And as a result, many of you saw more than one thing. But whenever you look at almost anything in your life, you can also, uh, uh, there's also more than one way to, to uh, see that thing. And oftentimes we get stuck in just seeing the rabbit or just seeing the duck and we don't take the time to look at it from a different perspective, right? So this, this type of paradigm shift that we need is when we're looking at something in one way, sometimes it's important to take a step back and try to look at it with fresh eyes, right? So some of us, uh, we have different paradigms, right? Some people are very friend-centered. Their friends are the center of their universe. If there's a problem, if there's drama with, within their friends, then everything uh, you know, is going badly. Some people are very stuff centered. They're very materialistic, right? They're, they're all about acquiring stuff, the latest Apple product or whatever it is. Some people, it's all about school and it's all about grades and, and GPA and, and, and that sort of thing. Other people, their parents are the center of their world, right? This isn't necessarily a bad thing in, in Islam, but sometimes they don't really have an identity that's separate from their parents. When they think about what they want to do, uh, they don't think in terms of what they want, they think about what their parents want, want for them. Some of us become obsessed with our sports or our hobbies. Some of us have heroes that we put up on a pedestal and, and, uh, you know, uh, and so on. Some people are so focused in on their enemies, right, and their, their, their perceived slights and things that have gone against them, that that's what they focus on. And then, of course, some people are very self-centered, right, and, and focused on their self and, and sort of don't see the world be, behind them. So all of these things require a paradigm shift. What, what are we looking for? Let's go to the next one. Um, so what we're looking for is a principle-centered approach. A so a Fletcher Club. I think someone's <laughs> not muted. 
Uh, I don't know who that is. Um, okay, so when we are principle centered as opposed to stuff centered and people centered, right? Then we have discovered the real thing. So some principles. Now, as we look at these principles, think about how each and every one of these are principles that are fundamental to our deen of Islam, right? Uh, principles of honesty, service, serving other people, hard work, respect, gratitude, moderation, fairness, integrity, loyalty, responsibility, balance, all of these things are things, if, if we wanted to, we could, we could find a hadith uh, or uh, an ayah of Quran or something to illustrate each and every one of these, how these principles, but when that becomes our paradigm, that our paradigm is not that we're focused just on our friends and our happiness is, is purely based on, you know, how our friends are treating us and, and, and so on. And instead, we, we base on the bedrock of these different principles, then we're going to be in much better shape. Okay, so uh, as it says here, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm, this is a, it's from a song, but it's also from a poem. Starting with the man in the mirror, I'm asking him to change his ways and no message could have been any clearer. If you wanna make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make a change, right? And the real tragedy is the tragedy of a man who never in his life braces himself for one supreme effort. He never stretches to his full capacity, never stands up to his full stature, right? And so sometimes, a lot of times we're afraid to really put our neck out there and really try for something, right? But as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beautifully uh, uh, tells us in the Quran, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Indeed, Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. So that's really the framework for this entire uh, talk about, about changing our habits, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to change our environment. It's not going to change the environment around us until we change what's inside of ourselves. So we have to focus on the things which we have control over. Um, so... Um, so this is another concept that that uh, that he talks about. This concept of the personal bank account. Okay, so we won't maybe read the 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 whole thing, but the idea is that each of us, just as we have a bank account where we keep money and uh, and uh, and so on, we there's also sort of a personal bank account, right? And we can either put deposits, we can either add to our personal bank account or we can withdraw from it. So what are some ways that we deposit in our um, personal bank account when we keep promises to ourselves? Okay, if we say I'm going to wake up for tahajjud tomorrow or I'm going to wake up for fajr tomorrow or suhoor or whatever the case may be, uh, and then we actually do it, then we're putting money, we're putting uh, something into our personal bank account. Whereas when we find that we are constantly breaking these promises, we say, I'm not going to play Roblox, uh, you know, uh, you know, as much during Ramadan, but then we do it just as much as we did before. Then we're breaking promises to ourselves, and we start to lose that willpower. Uh, another thing to do, doing small acts of kindness, right? This is when we do something small that maybe no one even notices. We we do something we're adding to our to our personal bank account, but when we keep things to ourselves. Right when we when we uh, you know don't don't share things with other people we're withdrawing from that and so on being gentle with ourselves right when sometimes we don't reach a goal and and uh, you know but it's it was really something that was a, a bit out of our control uh, we don't beat ourselves up uh, about those things when you beat yourself up you're you're making a withdrawal from your personal uh, bank account and so on you can you can see uh, the rest of the slide but I don't want to. Uh, spend too long in it. So really, we need to focus on keeping promises to ourselves, right? Keeping promises to ourselves. Uh, this is one of the, uh, uh, you know, the most important uh, things that we can do in order to, um, you know, start to feel better about ourselves, start to feel stronger, and, and so on, right? Um, so uh, this is uh, these are just some steps that that uh, that Sean Covey had in his book. So uh, in his book, so waking up, right, being pr uh, productive with our day often involves getting up when we plan to for three days in a row, right. Uh, a second one, identifying one easy task that needs to be done today. 
uh, something simple like doing our laundry or uh, actually reading the English assignment. That's a that's one that I that really resonates with me since I'm an English teacher. Uh, deciding uh, decide when you will do it and now keep your word and get it done. Right. So just do choose something small. Right. Say that you're going to do it and then follow through with it and you'll be adding to that personal bank account. Right. And you'll start to feel better about yourself and doing good is, uh, you know, become becomes a, a, a habit. A lot of times we get into this habit of saying, inshallah, you know, uh, I'll change if Allah gives me tawfiq. Right. But we, really, we are the ones who have to take the first step. We're the ones, uh, you know, if, even if you look at the, the famous uh, hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, uh, if you take, if you walk towards Allah, Allah comes running towards you. And, and I mean, it's a long, a long hadith. If you go by a hand span, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to you by an arm's length, right? If you look at all of these, the first step is always in, in, in something that we do, right? So now it's Ramadan, right? This is a time where we, where we change our priorities and we focus on, on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And so when we, when, uh, you know, we make this decision, we, we say that we're going to do something, you know, try, try really to stick, stick with it, being honest, right? The next time, I'm sure if you're a teenager, your parents are always asking you what you're doing, right? How, how are things going, right? And oftentimes the response is pretty much a, a non-response, sort of a shrug of the shoulders and so on. What if one time you actually answer that question, Right in the in the little check-in time, you actually answer and you and you put all the information about you know how things are going and why why things are going. What if we're feeling lethargic? What if we don't have any energy? What should we do? Try to get up and go for a walk. I I that's one of the best things I've discovered during this pandemic. You know, the, just the joy of, of walking and and being out. You know, we're we're all trapped in our homes now, but there are you know nature is out there. It's one of the safest things you can do during during these times. You know, try to set a goal of, of taking a certain number of steps or something like that. You know, listen to things that are interesting to you, podcasts or, or books on tape or, or, or things like that. And just try to uh, try to to go out, try to go an entire day without negative self-talk. This is something that plagues us all, that we're always putting ourselves down. Right. We talk. If you think about it, we talk about ourselves or to ourselves in a way that we would never talk to someone else. Right? If we heard someone else. Uh, you know, uh, if we saw someone talking to someone else in such an in such negative terms, we'd be very frustrated with them, right? But this is what we do to ourselves, and we're constantly bashing ourselves over the head. Um, and so, in terms of specifics that we can do, uh, sometime today, do some sort of an anonymous, a kind anonymous deed, write a thank you note, take out the trash right? Uh, make someone's bed, do something, figure out something that you can do without being asked and without drawing attention to it. And just, uh, just do that. And as Judy Garland, uh, the famous uh, singer and actress said, always be a first rate version of yourself instead of a second rate version of someone else. Okay, so Hamda, that was all sort of the introduction to, uh, to this. Now we're going to talk about, like I said, those three habits. So the first uh, habit, the first habit is to be proactive, okay? To be proactive as opposed to being reactive, okay? People are just about as happy as they make up their mind and make up their mind to be. This is something that Abraham uh, Lincoln said. So uh, the way that uh, Stephen Covey and Sean Covey say it is we should initiate change rather than reacting to events. And proactive people recognize that they are response able. In other words, they are capable of uh, uh, choosing their response, right? That we get to choose. We don't necessarily control what happens to us, right? We don't get to control and decide, you know, uh, you know what happens to us, but we do get to choose our response to those things that happen. So our life doesn't just happen. Whether we know it or not, it's carefully designed by us. All of our choices are our own. We choose happiness, we choose sadness, we choose success, we choose failure, we choose courage, we choose fear. Every single moment, every situation gives us a, an opportunity 
uh, to, to, uh, to you know, make those choices. And being proactive is about taking responsibility for your own life, not blaming everything. This is, this is the opposite. It's where we just blame everything on external forces. I would have done this, but this happened, right? We need to become response able, able to respond on our own. We shouldn't blame genetics or circumstances or conditions or anything. We have the full choice to choose our own behavior and choose our own response. Okay, and a lot of this comes down to the level of language, right? So this is these are these are important little things that we can think uh, in terms of how we respond uh, to things. Okay, so uh, here we have reactive guy sitting there. I can't help it, mom. It's just the way I am. Right? And you can see the mom looking fairly disappointed in, in her son. Okay, so reactive language. There's nothing I can do. That's just the way I am. He makes me so mad. They won't allow that. I have to do that. I can't. I must. Okay, no, notice all of these. Whereas proactive language, let's look. So instead of saying there's nothing I can do, you're trying to do the paradigm shift. You're looking for the duck if you're only seeing the bunny, right? Let's look at our alternatives. That's just the way I am, okay? That's the reactive uh, thought. What about I can choose a different approach? Uh, he makes me so mad. What about re recognizing that you're choosing to become mad and, and react that way um, and, and, uh, and so on. So reactive people, are very affected by their physical environment. They find external sources to blame for their behavior. If the weather is good, they feel good. If it isn't, then they, they feel bad and they blame the weather. These external forces are, are things, uh, are the, the, the primary factor uh, for, for these people. Um, one of the most important things you choose is, is your language, as I said before. A proactive person should use this, this uh, proactive uh, language. And this is something tangible that you can actually, that you can actually change and you can, uh, you, know, you can notice about yourself. And when you're feeling sort of upset or uh, out of control or you feel like you don't have control over your life, then you can look at the sort of language that you're using and you'll often find that it's very much reactive language. Okay, so the, another really important concept that he talks about is the circle of concern versus the circle of influence, right? So uh, proactive people focus their efforts on their circle of influence, things which they have control over, okay? So, uh, things that they can do something about, uh, their, their own health, Right, uh, they can focus on you know problems that they have studying uh, you know studying harder. Whereas reactive people focus on their circle of concern, things over which they have little or no concern, the national debt or terrorism or the weather or things like that. And so you can see that people with the with the proactive focus, as in the middle slide, their uh, their circle of influence widens. They have influence over more things, and the number of things, the circle of concern, the things which they don't have power over, becomes smaller, right? Whereas the reactive person, they they sort of box themselves in, and they have very little control over over the things in the middle. Their circle of influence and the circle of concern becomes uh, very large. Right? So all of this so far has been looking at it in general terms. What about Islam? What does Islam say uh, uh, about these, uh, these things? Right? So here we have some hadith. Let's have, uh, I've been talking for a really long time. Um, let's see, any volunteers to read? Let's go with Omar. I don't know which Omar this is, but Omar, could you read the uh, Be Conscious of Allah hadith? Be conscious of Allah wherever you are. Follow the bad deed with a good one to erase it. And engage and engage others with beautiful character. Dirmali. Excellent. And someone else gets the privilege of reading another hadith. How about Yumna? The strong is not the one who overcomes the people by his strength. The strong is the one who controls himself while in air. MashaAllah. So here are two hadith uh, about the Prophet and they they uh, they both have to do with being proactive. So let's unpack that a little bit. Um, so 
our understanding of uh, of sin should be mobilizing, not debilitating. Be conscious of Allah wherever you are. Follow a bad deed with a good one to erase it. Okay, so too often we respond to a sin. So if we make a mistake, we break a promise, we break a promise to Allah, we miss a prayer, we, do, we don't need to talk about all the different things that, that people might have done, but we respond by putting ourselves in the, the corner and abusing ourselves psychologically and, and so on. This is not what Allah SWT wants from us. Of course, it's good that we feel some level of, uh, of regret and, uh, and guilt uh, about the sin, but it shouldn't stop us from moving forward to good deeds. We, we shouldn't, people, we tend to use our sins as an excuse to stay behind, uh, but uh, instead we should use uh, any mistakes that we make as, a, as something forcing us to go forward. Oops, sorry. Let me go back. Um, so when, again, when we, when we, uh, when we make a, a, a mistake, then try to follow up the, the, the bad deed with a good deed to erase this, right? This is a, a form of being uh, proactive. And if we have firm conviction, um, then we will see, you know, when we, when we put Islam first and we have that as our, as our priority, then any loss that, that we face along the way will seem very minor com comparatively. Okay, so... Uh, this is something that that same friend, uh, Nabil, I remember him uh, talking about, the one who introduced me to Islam. He said, when people are faced with a problem, there are three different ways they can respond, right? The first level is, is they, they say, how can I solve this problem, right? And so this is the way that many people in the world, most non-Muslims, this is their, their focus. When they're faced with a problem, they say, how can I solve this problem, okay? It's understandable that people go there, but that's not really what the deen teaches us. The, the next level, which we should be aspiring to, is how would the Prophet Sallallahu have solved this problem, right? When, when something comes upon us, instead of looking at ourselves, we say, how would the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi have solved this problem? What is Islam's take on this? How, how would, uh, you know, what is the guidance from our deen when it comes to this matter, right? But the third level and the really highest level, which very, very few people uh, uh, reach, is that when a problem faces you, your response to that problem is automatically uh, the response that the Prophet ﷺ would have had, right? In other words, there's no conscious thought, what would the Prophet ﷺ do? You're leading a lifestyle that's so close and similar to the lifestyle of the Prophet ﷺ that when you, uh, that when you face this uh, difficulty, you immediately respond in this way, this is the 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 power of habit, right? When you have when you've developed a habit, then it's something that's ingrained inside of you, right? So our our habits are our destiny. When we have bad habits, right? When we have the habit of of snacking, uh, you know, every single day, it's going to it's going to add up over time, right? And we're going to gain lots and lots of weight, right? When we when we have good habits, right? And when we and the best of all habits is the habit to to practice the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so that whenever we are faced with some sort of difficulty that we're already leading that lifestyle and we already respond to that in that kind of way. Okay, I know this is uh, getting long, inshallah, where uh, we have two more habits and, and then at the end there will be a chance to, uh, to win a prize to see how well you were paying attention. Um, so second habit, uh, begin with the end in mind. Okay, so I want to I want us to take a little break from this. I want to do a little thought experiment. So, uh, if you, I want you to try to visualize something. So, if it helps, you might choose to close your eyes and uh, try to concentrate uh, uh, on what I, what I'm saying. So, imagine that you are on your way to the masjid. We can say the Sharon Masjid since uh, you know that's uh, that's where the, this event is is virtually being held. So imagine you're on the way to the Sharon Masjid and you see a long line of cars departing. Everyone is driving in the same direction slowly with their lights on. So you can join in the procession, not knowing where you're going. So as this long line of cars snakes along out of the town, it slowly dawns on you that you're driving toward the graveyard. This is something that maybe some of you have experienced before when, you, when you've uh, you know, gone, uh, when someone has died and you've gone to the graveyard. So you start wondering who died 
and whether you knew them. The cars finally stop at that graveyard and people begin getting out, walking slowly, sadly, with their heads bowed. You push to the front of the crowd to see who has died. You can finally see the body shrouded in white. And then the awful realization dawns on you. Uh, sorry, this is a little bit morbid, but it is that you, it is you who have died. It's you who's being buried. So imagine this, this scenario. You, you've come, you've seen this funeral procession, you start following it, and then you realize, subhanAllah, this is actually my own funeral. Afterwards, three people speak, sharing their memories of you. The first is a member of your family. They tell stories about you and your life. Next, your best friend shares their memories. Finally, uh, a sheikh, a responsible member of the masjid, talks about your life. What do these? What are these people going to say? Right? What are they going to say when they're talking about you? If you've taken this visualization seriously and have tried to honestly imagine what people are going to say about you when you're gone, then you'll have a better sense of your of your values. So ultimately, this entire deen of Islam is designed to prepare us for that moment, right? If we if we open our eyes, if they were closed, if you look at that picture of the grave, I know it's a very scary thought and it's not something that we like to think about a lot, but ultimately that is our ultimate destination, right? So when we begin with the end in mind with from the Islamic context, we need to imagine that eventually one day, we are going to be in that place, that, that grave, that place of, of complete emptiness. And inshallah, when we, if we begin with that end in mind and we work backwards, then we can uh, design our lives in a way that that will be the best moment of our lives. That will be the moment where we begin to taste the, the sweetness of, of, uh, of paradise. Okay, so in order to, to understand beginning with the end in mind, we need to distinguish between management and leadership. So here are a few uh, quotes about management and leadership. So management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things. Management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things. A quote straight from Stephen Covey, management is efficiency in climbing the ladder of success. Leadership determines whether the ladder is really, is leaning against the right wall. Okay, so he gives an, <clears throat> another thought uh, uh, experiment here. You can, you can quickly grasp the difference between management and leadership if you envision a group of explorers cutting their way through a jungle with machetes. So here we see the guy with his machete. Uh, they're cutting through the undergrowth, clearing it out. The managers are behind them. What are the managers doing? Sharpening the machetes, writing policy manuals, holding muscle development programs, uh, bringing in improved technologies and so on. But what's the leader doing during this time? The leader is the one who's climbing the tallest tree, surveying the entire situation. And he says, wrong jungle, right? Wrong jungle. You're, you're cutting through this. Where you get lost in the sauce, right? You get lost in the, 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 uh, the trees and you can't see the entire forest, right? This is what happens uh, to so many people. Right? But what do those managers say? Hey, you know, be quiet, shut up, we're making progress here. Right? So as individuals, uh, we're often uh, so busy cutting through the, the jungle, cutting through the, the undergrowth, that we don't even realize that we're in the wrong jungle. Right? And this is where, uh, you know, Islam comes in. Right? So we have a concept within Islam that's so beautiful, the Qibla. I remember another thing about Nabil. When, when he used to pray, he actually had a prayer carpet that looked sort of like this one on, on the left that had a compass built in into it, right? These days we have the, the apps on our phone, you know, um, uh, that, that, you know, will we'll find the Qibla for us wherever we are. But, you know, this was a simpler time when, when we actually had to rely on compasses. So you looked at where you were in the world and you set it up and you could find the Qibla based on that compass right inside the, the prayer mat. But what a beautiful metaphor it is that we have this compass, right? Qibla is our moral compass. So we are in need of this, this uh, compass uh, and less in need of, uh, more in need of a compass and less in need of a roadmap. We often don't know what things are going to uh, look like, but when we have this inner compass, this qibla, there's an expression in South Africa that I used to love when I, when I lived there. They, if, if someone was struggling with their deen, they'd say, oh, he's off the qibla. He's off the qibla, man. 
right? Uh, that that like he'd fallen he'd fallen off the 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 path of uh, uh, of uh, Islam, right? So a lot of times uh, as Muslims, especially like students, uh, people become obsessed with cut, you know, cutting their way through the wrong jungle. So the SAT scores or the number of zeros in our bank accounts or, uh, you know, other things like that become more important to us than our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, uh, you know, whether we, we make, our, make our salat and so on. Even if we're in school, we do the work. How many students, like, they always do their work, but they're never really learning anything from their work. Right, they they they're getting the work done, but they're not actually learning uh, something. So it's critically important that we always begin with uh, the end in mind. And for Muslims, that means that we should always have an akhirah focus. Right, and the Prophet ﷺ himself taught us about this. Right, in a famous uh, hadith, he said, "Do you know in what relation your relatives, your wealth, and your deeds stand to you?" Right, it's it's a fairly long hadith. I don't think I'll I'll go through the the whole thing. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi you know, uh, talked uh, uh, about the, these things as being like three brothers, right? And one brother, the relatives, right? One brother goes to the grave and talks about the person and cries for the person, but then returns home. The wealth, as soon as you die, it forsakes you. It's the relative that forsakes you and goes to someone else. The only deed that goes with you inside the grave is the, the good deeds, Right, the the things that we've left behind, the deeds that we've that we've left behind, and uh, these are the things which will actually get inside of our grave and and testify and uh, on our behalves and so on. Even the Sahaba, radiyallahu an, needed reminders. Right, so there's again a long story that I won't uh, go into uh, too much, uh, but where uh, the Prophet sallam, was was separated from his wives for some time. And Omar came into him, and he saw that the Prophet ﷺ had been sleeping, you know, on a, a mat such that the uh, the uh, the mat was had left impressions on the face of the Prophet ﷺ. And you know he uh, you know he was upset, and he he said, how how is it that you're living like this when the Persians are living in such splendor? How can you, the chosen Prophet of Allah, be like this? And at this, the Prophet ﷺ sat up. He was angry. He said, Oh, Omar radiallahu anh, are you still in doubt about this matter? Ease and comfort in the hereafter are much better than ease and comfort in this world. The unbelievers are enjoying this share of the good things in this very world, whereas we have all such things in store for us in the next. Right? So even the Sahaba struggled with this akhirah focus, keeping the end in mind. And the Prophet ﷺ reminded them. Okay? So... Anytime we talk about these things, right, it's it's possible to go a little too far, even in the religious uh, spectra, in, you know, in terms of in terms of the, the deen. Some people, they are extremists in terms of following their, their desires, but some people become extremists in terms of following the deen to such an extent that they make it very, very difficult on people. Right. And they and they, uh, you know, that's the only thing that they can ever talk about and so on. And so one of the best uh, examples I've I've uh, I've heard about this is that, you know, just because we seek the Akhira, right, just because we're going after the Akhira doesn't mean that we should forget about and disengage from the dunya, that we should just go and sit in the masjid all day and make our dhikr all day and, and give up on the world. That's not what Islam is teaching us. So if we think about the dunya as our shadow, right. If you make the goal of your life, the dunya, right? Think of it as your shadow. If you chase after your shadow as the person in that first image is, is doing, the shadow is always going to be one step in front of you. By definition of what a shadow is, if you chase after your shadow, the shadow is always going to be one step in front of you. So what? how do you solve this? Okay, as it says in that, in that image, turn your face towards the sun and let the shadows fall behind you. If we... Uh, you know, if we turn towards the light, towards the sun, the nur of Islam, then, and we follow that, what's going to happen? The shadow is obediently going to follow behind us. In other words, when we have Islam as our focus and we put Islam as, the, uh, uh, you know, our primary goal in our life, then the shadow will follow behind and we're, we'll get Rabbana atina fid dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina adab al nar. Okay, so the last one, and I know we're trying to finish by 2.30, so inshallah, uh, I'll go quickly with this one. The last uh, habit that I'll do today is to put first things first. 
right? So put first things first. This is all about our priorities. So a couple of quotes about that. Most of us spend too much time on what is urgent and not enough time on what is important. Most of us spend too much time on what is urgent and not enough time on what is important. Things which matter the most must never be at the mercy of things which matter least. Okay, so it's all about uh, priority. So one of our presidents, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, right? He had this famous thing called the Eisenhower box. He once famously said, I have two kinds of problems, the urgent and the important. The urgent are not important and the important are never urgent. So he came up with a uh, prioritization framework, right? And uh, you can see it here in, in the box. Things, uh, priority one are things which are both urgent and important. Those are things which you should do immediately. Uh, other things which are important but not urgent, you should decide. You should, you should, uh, you know, figure out a time when you, when you want to when you want to do it. Um, priority three are are the things that are urgent but not important. Those you should give to someone else. You should delegate, right? So if something is uh, not uh, is is urgent but it's not important, then you should uh, get someone else to do it. <laughs> And then things which are not important and are not urgent, those are simply things that you should delete, right? This is the concept of the Eisenhower uh, box. And so um, uh, Sean Covey took this and he uh, applied it to teenagers, the different types of uh, teenagers. So we have the procrastinator, right? The prioritizer, the yes man, and the slacker, right? And you can see how all of these, uh, all of these different things fit in, in these boxes. So really we wanna be able to be the prioritizer, right? This is the, 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 uh, the procrastinator waits until things are super urgent, right? Important things are super urgent and that's the only thing which spurs them you know, to, uh, to, to work, right? Um, and obviously you know, the, the, uh, the yes men and, and the worst of all the slacker, the people who don't have their priorities straight and focus on, on the less important things. Whereas the prioritizer, that's the person right, who has goals most, some of them are not urgent goals, not things that they need to, uh, to accomplish uh, immediately, but they make a plan to figure out how they're going to accomplish those things. Okay, so how do we do this? So one of the, one of the uh, most uh, important words in the English language is the word no, right? Uh, if, you, uh, if you learn how to say no, because uh, you, you need to prioritize. So sometimes you need to be able to figure out what you can say yes to and what you can say no to because so that when you say yes to something that you give it your all. So if it's a priority, you'll find a way. If it isn't, you'll find an excuse, right? The reason most goals are not achieved is that we spend our time doing second things first. And finally, you have to decide, this is what Stephen Covey himself said, you have to decide what your highest priorities are and have the courage pleasantly, smilingly, non-apologetically to say no to other things. So put first things first. In order to put first things first, you need to put last things last. And a lot of times that means saying no. It also involves figuring out how to judge yourself, choosing the right scoreboard. So Albert Einstein said uh, famously, not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. Right? Not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. And uh, someone else, he said, wise are those who learn that the bottom line doesn't always have to be their top priority. So the bottom line is like, you know, what comes out in the very end, right? And for a lot of people who are business oriented and so on, the bottom line is always the, the thing which comes, which comes first. Um, but, but uh, you know, the bottom line doesn't always have to be their top priority. There are other things that are more important, right, uh, than this and like maintaining your integrity and things like, like that. Um, let's, uh, let, I'm just gonna skip to, to this, uh, this slide. So this is another sort of disturbing image of, of a really bad traffic accident. And then you see the aftermath in the emergency room. So this is all about priorities. So Islam has a, a whole concept within fiqh called the fiqh al-awwaliyat, the fiqh of priorities. So if you imagine this catastrophic traffic accident, among the injured people, uh, people notice that there's someone who's badly injured and you know they've got blood gushing and so on. They're taken to the hospital. 
Uh, and there, imagine that the emergency doctor notices that the patient has many broken bones. So he decides to start you know, uh, fixing the broken bones, taking x-rays and, and, and so on, right? So obviously in this situation, broken bones are a big deal, right? You need to get them fixed. But if someone's bleeding and is in mortal danger, the, the priority needs to be to stop the bleeding. Right. If you stop, if you don't stop the bleeding, the person won't survive. Right. And if they don't survive, it doesn't matter if their bones broken or not. So it's all about fiqh al awaliyat, figuring out what your set of priorities is and uh, and and doing putting first things first. Right. And so Islam uh, has uh, you know a lot to say on this. And again, I'm not I'm not trying not to make this too uh, uh, scholarly or anything. But Islam talks about the dururiyat, the most important things, uh, the the complements, uh, the embellishments, right? Those are those are things. And then we have uh, this this other uh, pyramid, um, uh, you know, where we're focusing on our uh, religion and then life and and so on. Islam uh, and the the scholars of Islam have figured out with the fiqh al awaliyat, you know, which things should come first. And specifically, they've uh, they focused on the priority of durable deeds over intermittent ones, things which uh, you know uh, last for a long time over things which are temporary. The priority of far-reaching beneficial deeds, things which help many many people over limited ones, and the priority of deeds that have more lasting and far-reaching uh, uh, effect. Right, so this is uh, this is all about uh, this in our own Eisenhower boxes. Right, the the most important thing, which might not seem that urgent, but is clearly important, is the need to form a connection with our Creator. This is the the most important thing. So we need to schedule time for us. So fortunately, Islam has built in time during the year. Right, right now we have the month of Ramadan. Right, during the year, our spiritual batteries become. Right, uh, they they start to lose their their energy, and then Islam comes along, and this is the way we can plug into that into that battery, right? Uh, we can plug into the uh, the the battery, and uh, through this, we will inshallah, um, uh, you know, strengthen our uh, our iman. And so, alhamdulillah, we're five days, six days into into Ramadan now, so we need to really try to. Uh, you know, put first things first, really focus on our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For those of you who are in public school and have the next week off, this is an incredible opportunity for you to, uh, you know, come to come to the masjid if you're comfortable doing that, or or at least, uh, you know, uh, pray tarawih, things which might have held you back, uh, studies, homework, and, and so on, uh, which are which are preventing you uh, before. Now you have a chance to really uh, prioritize those things. Okay. So uh, finally, um, we have our uh, last thing. As I said before, uh, there will be a prize winner at the end. My students will be very familiar with this. We are going to be doing a Kahoot uh, to figure out who will win the prize. Um, let me just stop sharing this so I can make sure that I'm sharing it properly. Uh, here we go. All right. So for, uh, for those of you, uh, I, I suspect since most of the people here are uh, uh, teenagers themselves, so you've probably done cahoots before. If uh, you haven't, um, if you have a, a phone with you, you could do it on your phone. Otherwise, you can do it on your same device that, you're, that you've joined the meeting with. So you um, go to the uh, Kahoot uh, app or you can go to www.kahoot.it and then you put this pin, right? Uh, unfortunately, they don't have a direct game code that I can put in the chat. I can put, um, I can put this. So I will give you a couple of minutes uh, to do this. Uh, I didn't actually talk to the organizers about uh, an appropriate prize. I was thinking uh, we could probably do some sort of a gift card so if you do win this Kahoot, then I'm gonna just need to get your contact information so that I can uh, I can figure out how to how to send a, a gift card to you. For those of you who are patient, stayed with this for all this time, it's good for you to get some sort of prize in the end. Okay, so I see 16 people joined. I don't know. I I think there are about 29 people in the meeting. Um, I don't know if everyone's going to join this. I'll give it another. 
uh, another minute or so before we start. So these are all going to be questions. Uh, I should say I did not actually make this Kahoot myself, but I did sort of adapt it from a different source. Um, so it will be a little less heavy on the Islamic concepts and more on the on the uh, habit, the seven habits uh, uh, concepts. Um, okay. We have 21 people, mashallah, this is gonna be a pretty competitive one. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna hit start. 10 seconds, last chance for anyone to join. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, bismillah. So you'll see the question on my screen and just the answer on yours. Defining your missions or goals in life best reflects this habit. Which habit do we have here? Put first things that well, you can read. So obviously you need to be able to see my screen in order to do this. Okay. Beginning with the end in mind. Tricky one. I, uh, I I know that I'm not taking this myself, so I don't even know if I would have, uh, even though I gave the talk, I'm not sure I would have had this, but defining your missions, right? You have to figure out where you're trying to get to and then try to get there. All right, so early lead. Mashallah. Next up, which of these behaviors is not proactive? Which of these behaviors is not proactive? This is confusing because it has a not in there. Which of these is not proactive? Looks like most people are answering within 20 seconds or so, so I think I might skip after 20 seconds for future questions. All right, there you go. Cramming for a, a test the night before. That's very much reactive, waiting till the end. Okay. Same leader. Which of these behaviors is reactive? Reactive. Okay, all right, there we go, mashallah. Getting better and better as we go. All right, Just a few more questions. People with this type of thinking often give in to peer pressure. Oh, actually, sorry, this one I meant to cut. You'll have to guess on this one. We haven't talked about uh, this. This is the fourth habit that we will talk about next time. So I, some people got lucky or maybe they just knew it somehow. Okay. Which of the following best represents an achievable goal? Achievable goal. These are tricky. Okay. Nice, mashallah. I guess it wasn't so tricky. Lots of movement on the leaderboard. I think this will come down to the very end. Someone who puts important things first best fits this quadrant. Okay, puts important things first. Remember the Eisenhower box and then the teenager version of it. Which person is that? Okay, mashallah. 19 people. Very impressive. You guys are all listening closely. I talked way more during today than I'd usually do in class. The point of view, preference, or belief. 
What is that? The point of view, preference, or belief? Is that a principle, a paradigm, a habit, or a deposit? Okay, that one was the paradigm. I think the next question, we'll see what happens with that. A moral belief or truth that is the foundation of who someone is. What is that one? The moral belief or truth that is the foundation of who someone is. Mashallah, there's our principle. <laughs> okay, this word means good or productive. Ooh. The seven habits of what? Highly. Now we could do an English lesson on the difference between effect and affect, but I don't think you wanna do that on your day off. Uh, effective, mashallah. Which of these is a personal bank account deposit? Remember the personal bank account, which one is a deposit? Putting something into your personal bank account. So something that we should all try to do. MashaAllah. Okay. Next up we have, who is the author? I mentioned this a few times. Let's see if you remember. Who's the author of Seven Habits of Highly Effective Teens? Not effective people, but effective teens. Uh, yep, so Stephen Covey is the father. He wrote the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If I'm cynical, I think he probably made a lot of money off of it. And so his son wanted to get in on the action and he wrote the Effective Teens book. Uh, but either way, I, I do think the teens book is, is uh, you know, something that you could all, uh, it's a book that you can actually go out and, and get on Amazon or somewhere else um, that uh, is aimed at this, uh, this age. Okay, Fatima's risen to the lead, but it's very, very, very close. Panala. A habit is... MashaAllah, wow. Almost a perfect score. Something you do repeatedly. Okay. Fatima is on fire, but there's still plenty of time. Jeff is depressed whenever his friends can't hang out. His paradigm center is. What has he based his whole life around? These days, a lot of our friends might be online friends. Let's say our online friend is not being nice to us or is ignoring us, right? He focused on friends. Excellent. Everyone has different blank of blank. Hmm. Think about those pictures of the duck or the rabbit. After 10 seconds. Okay. Points of view, mashallah. Oh, a little change on the leaderboard. Who are people that you can borrow strength from when you're down? My students have a theory that whenever all of these is a choice, it's always the answer. I'm not sure that that's totally true, but in this case it was. Uh, okay. Which best characterizes making a deposit to one's soul? Ooh. Huh. Let's 
Let's give it a couple more seconds. Whoa. All right. I, I don't think I agree with that answer. I definitely would have put doing small acts of kindness myself. Um, alhamdulillah. So don't feel bad. Um, pretty much no change on the leaderboard. In the circle of control, what is the only thing we can control? Ooh, he spelled the word weather wrong. Which one can we control? And nice. Okay. It needs to be a hard question. See how it finishes, 18 or 19. RBA deposits include all except, what should say? It's all about your bank account deposits. All right, I'll leave this one open a little longer because not everyone's answered yet. It's a tricky one. This could de determine the winner. Let's see, Bismillah. Oh, most people got it. Okay, final question. It's very, very close. I think any, certainly any of the top four people, maybe, maybe even number five could get it. Maybe someone will come from nowhere. Bismillah. Which title identifies quadrant two? Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, you have to remember that slide. Who was really paying attention? Tricky one to end on. All right, I don't want to. I don't want to go forward because well, it looks like some people may have given up. Okay. Oh, y'all got it, mashallah. Not, not all. All right, here's the podium, the grand finale. Lean, mashallah, one of my students. Then we have Yomna, another one of my students. And Ines, mashallah. So Ines is our winner. Look, they all got the same score. It's just about the speed of answering. Um, so, Ines, if you could privately send me, like, uh, your email or something, and then I can get in contact with you. Uh, but for everyone, inshallah, uh, the, the, like I said, this was, we did the first three habits today. The next time we'll do the, the, fine, the remaining habits. That will be in two weeks from today. I think there will be another speaker uh, next week at this time. Uh, so it's a really great way to spend Ramadan. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Um, thank you, Ines, for sending me your, your email. Uh, and inshallah, I will um, uh, look forward to seeing you all in a couple of weeks. And jazakallah khair. I'm happy to stick around if anyone has any questions. But I know this has taken a long time, so I'm sure some of you want to go. So assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Have a great Ramadan. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yes, and Jane.